lifts my eyes to the hills where my help is coming. Okay, uh, today we're going to begin our study on uh, the book of Jude. Turn in your Bibles to Jude, right before Revelation, next to the last book of the Bible. Another one chapter uh, book of the Bible is Jude. So we started with Obadiah, then we looked at uh, then we looked at Philemon, and now we're looking at Jude, another one chapter book of the Bible. Uh, tell me anything that you already know about the book of Jude. I mentioned last week that we're going to be studying that this week. So tell me anything that you know about the book of Jude. There's there's some false doctrine being brought in and the things it's addressing. Okay. That's that's the main thought right there. There are false doctrines that are being taught, and he's warning the saints of God they'd better beware of those false doctrines. And they'd better fight against those false doctrines coming in. Okay? And the people. It's not just the false doctrines, but the people that are bringing those false doctrines. <clears throat> and so many of the times people say, well, uh, hate the sin, but love the sinner. In other words, no matter what they do, you're to just overlook what they're doing. Just don't like... You don't, you don't deal with the person. You okay. Just ignore what they've said and move on. Okay. All right. That's the problem that many times people have today. The misconception they have of the Bible is you don't address people and what they're doing wrong. You just talk about the sin, but you don't. You just overlook the person doing what's wrong, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the the sin is to be addressed, but the sinner is also to be addressed. Okay. So in the book of Jude, he addresses the fact that there are false teachers that are coming in. And that the uh, saints of God, the children of God, were to earnestly contend for the faith. Let's look at the first four verses. Uh, Jude, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ are called. Okay, stop. You have all three persons of the Godhead mentioned there. All three persons and a work that each of the persons in the Godhead has done. What are the three persons in the Godhead that are mentioned? Uh, Jesus, well, it says the servant of Jesus Christ, and then sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Okay. Sanctified by God the Father. Tell me when were we, what does the word sanctify mean? It means set apart for a holy use. And Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. When were we sanctified by God the Father? When were we set apart by God the Father? Before the foundation of the world. So we were sanctified by God the Father. We were set apart by God the Father before the foundation of the world, we are preserved in Jesus Christ. What does that mean, that we are preserved in Jesus Christ? The, the work of Christ cannot be undone. Okay, preserved. the work of Christ cannot be undone. The work that Christ did was to save us from our sins, and we are preserved in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're kept by Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God because of the work of Jesus Christ. So we're preserved in Christ Jesus. And then he says, and called. And that calling from death to life is the work of the Holy Spirit. So we, we are sanctified by whom? Sanctified by whom? God the Father. Then we are preserved in Christ Jesus. And then we're called from death to life by the Holy Spirit. So you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. All right, go ahead, uh, verse 2 and Verse 2, 3, and 4. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you, and ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Take that last phrase, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered, which was once delivered unto the saints, and tell me what does that mean? 
that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So just mean we keep pressing forward? Okay, keep pressing forward earnestly. What does the word contend for? Contend. What is implied with that word contend? Say fight or compete. Uh, that you should earnest contend, fight for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, the faith, the faith. There's faith that's part of the fruit of the Spirit of God. And that is placed in every child of God when they're born of the Spirit of God. Galatians chapter 5 says that the fruit of the Spirit is, and it lists the fruit, nine parts of the fruit of the Spirit. That's faith that was implanted in every born-again child of God when they were quickened, when they were made alive, they were given faith. It's that faith that enables us to believe in God, trust in God, uh, and, and uh, that faith is very, very important. But then there is also the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That, that faith is different than the faith that's put in us when we're born in the Spirit. What is the faith that was once delivered to the saints? It's the scriptures. This is the body of truth that's contained in the word of God. This is the faith that was once delivered to the saints. This is the word of God. And we're to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Sometimes people say, what is your faith? Well, what they're asking you, what do you believe the Bible is teaching? What is your faith? Uh, this is the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And you are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Okay? All right, now, it's by faith that God gave you in the new birth that you know that this is the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And the scripture talks about that uh, we're, uh, it's from faith to faith, two different kinds of faith. All right, this is the faith that we're to contend for. Fight for the truth that's in the word of God. All right, now, read verse 3 again, the last phrase, and then tell me again, what does that mean? Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And I just feel like it's, like you said, like the fight for the word of God. Okay, stand fight. For stand up for the truth. Stand up for the word of God. Okay, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Go ahead, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into mischievousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so what's he saying in verse 4? That there's uh, certain men who will try to like turn the word of God and, like we were saying before, just uh, false doctrines. Yes. Yes. All through the scriptures, it, it doesn't matter if you read the book of Acts where God called or Paul called all the elders of the church together. He told them, he said, there are going to come people that are going to try to deny the truth that I've taught you. He's warning them about them. All through the scriptures, the Bible keeps warning there are people that are evil and ungodly. They're of the devil and they're going to try to distort uh, and pollute the word of God. Okay. And so he says, there are certain men crept in unawares. What does that mean, they were crept in unawares? There you are. There's going to be smooth talk. You think they're going to be ugly men? Nah, they don't be ugly. You think they're going to be really, really nice to you? Absolutely. They're evil, and they know how the devil works because they're working for the devil. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, and then he names two things that they're doing. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the two main things that he addresses. First thing is that they are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. That word lasciviousness means a license to do evil. Tell me how people turn the grace of God into a license to do evil. Okay, bingo. Bingo. You're a hero for accepting these people. You're a hero for loving them. 
It doesn't make a lot of difference what people believe. Love them anyway. That's a doctrine of the devil. Hate the sin. Love the sin. All right, there again. These are phrases that are very common today. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. Uh, no, the scripture says you're to fight against those sinners that are bringing in false doctrine. And they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Uh, tell me more about how we turn the grace of God into a license to do evil. The way my dad has always like, kind of taught it to me is like, to begin with an offer. You get people turn grace into a get out of jail free. Okay, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. They turn uh, the word grace into, well, God forgives me. God's gracious. And not only do the individuals who do wrong use that, quote, get out of jail free card, saying, well, God's gracious, God's overlooked this. But they want people to be thinking of grace as you just overlook everything in, in everybody's life. So they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And he says that's one of the main things, that's the first thing he mentions that they're to be fighting against. They're creeping in with that false doctrine of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And the second one is they're denying uh, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So. I think it's important, Brother Billy, that we understand that people come into the church who will stand on those fundamental doctrines that we're called and yet they'll distort that that because I'm called I, I have to say I have to do whatever I want to and continue to stand so they're not saying something that's wrong in scripture but their manner of life lives completely contrary to what that grace has given us okay what brother, what brother Clay is saying is they're not saying something fundamentally wrong but the way they're living is clear evidence that they're not understanding the grace of God uh, and the truth of God and the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Their manner of life. They may, say, they may believe in election, predestination, salvation by grace. They may believe in all the kind of fundamental doctrines that the Word of God teaches, but it's their manner of life. Well, they'll say, we're all sinners. Yeah, right. That's the extent of their faith. Their, right. their, their belief is we're all sinners. Right. Which but, is a true statement, but yes, they don't understand. Statement. That's the reason there's one chapter in that book on there are two, two kinds of sinners taught in the Word of God. Yeah. All right. The, uh, just like, just like Satan did when he was tempting Christ, he he would use a partial truth, a portion of Scripture, out of context. Yes. So, you know, a partial truth will harder to fight against to recognize than a flat out lie. Yes. Everybody hear what he said. A partial truth is harder to fight against than a straight out lie. Satan will do exactly. He'll take scripture, pull it out of context, distort it, and have people believing something that's completely false, and they'll quote scripture to support their false belief. Do you have any idea of any scripture they might do? Does not that you may not do it. Wow. I don't know of one scripture that's more quoted by heathens, people that hate God and the truth of God, than judge not that you be not judged. And then the second verse that they also quote is what? Let him that's without sin cast the first stone. Now those two those two phrases uh, both of which are made by Jesus Christ, they're distorted by people of God, and they use those scriptures to not carry out the judgment that God's word calls to be carried out. They have God's word contradicting itself. And God's word never does that. And any time that we're teaching something in one portion of scripture that contradicts something in other parts of God's word, then we're promoting false doctrine. We're one of those that are teaching things that are contrary uh, to the truth of God's word. You have to be careful to know what the truth is. I believe you do. Right. And so there are people that are going to teach false doctrine. Always will be, always. Hold your finger here and back up to Acts. I, I just want you to remember that, and, and this is true all through the scriptures where 
men of God are nearing the end of their life, and their number one concern is there are going to be people that are come in with false doctrines. I'm 75 years old. I believe that there will be people that will be coming in with false doctrines when I'm gone. Tell me why. Why do I believe that? God's word says so. Okay, because God's word says it's going to happen. There's been an example after example in the churches. There's example after example in the scriptures. Where are all the seven churches of Asia today? Where are those seven churches of Asia today? They're not in existence. They weren't in existence 200 years after uh, those letters were written. Why are they no longer existing today? Why are they no longer existing? Say it again. Okay, because of false doctrine and false practices. Uh, and God removed his candlestick and the churches died. Uh, there are many, many churches today who are dead. I told a group of preachers 30 years ago, I said, uh, if I was an evil person, I'd go around and I'd offer churches money for their building property if they ever closed their doors. I'd offer them half what it's worth. And they'd probably sell, you know, if we ever closed our doors. Because the handwriting was on the wall. There were going to be churches that were closing the doors right and left. You follow me? Uh, Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28, 29, uh, and 30. Acts chapter 20. He's called, this is the Apostle Paul calling all the elders of the church at Ephesus together. And here's what he says to them. Take heed therefore of yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath laid you overseers. So who are the number one people that are to overlook the flock, watch over the flock, and warn the flock when there are those that are teaching false doctrines. Pastors. Pastors are the number one. Okay, go ahead. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I love this, that after my departing shall grievous fools enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now why did he know that? Why did Paul know that after his departure, why did he know they would wait till after his departure? Because he was going to contend with them. They weren't about to fight Paul. They couldn't win the battle. So they were going to wait till he was dead and gone. After my departure, there will come in grievous wolves. Those are not the words used in the book of Jude, but that's the same people, same kind of people that he's talking about. There will come in grievous wolves entering in among you, not sparing the flock. Verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Okay, so he's saying two things, one in verse 29 and one in 30. What's he saying? New people will come in that are teaching false things. Okay, new people will come in that are teaching false things and? And some of the men here amongst you will rise up and start. False okay, now what causes that? What would ever cause somebody, how in the world could Hamp or Brother Brooks or Brother Lee or how could anybody in this church ever change and start teaching false doctrine? How could that happen? Why would it happen? Well, opportunity, because the pastor is not there, so there's so people are looking for somebody to fill that void. Okay, the people are looking for something to fill that void. They're looking for a person to fill the void of the pastor that's gone. That's one thing. And so, what kind of people are they going to be looking for? Nice ones. Nice ones. Right. And therefore, if a people have a choice of having a man that's going to confront them with sin in their life, Versus somebody that's going to say, God loves you and everything's going to be fine. Which one are they going to normally choose? And therefore, people that have been taught what's right and brought up with what's right, if they want the leadership role that has been vacated because of death or whatever, then what are they going to do? They're going to appeal to the flesh of the people in the church. 
Okay? And that's what the book of Jude is, is about. He says you've got to fight on your hands. You've got to fight against those false doctrines. Do you think you could earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints? Do you think you could, number one, could you recognize false doctrine? And number two, could you take the truth of God's word and be sure the church stayed in that? Okay, the Lord willing. Very good. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there may be there may be things that you vaguely know and you understand. They're, you know they're in the Bible, but unless you can take the scriptures and prove it, you're not going to be able to earnestly contend with the faith that wants to live in the saints. Because scriptures are going to be used right and left. You will not find false teachers, evil men creeping in that aren't going to use the scriptures. They're going to use the scriptures. They're going to distort the scriptures. Just like Satan when he was tempting Jesus Christ. Quote scripture, quote scripture, quote scripture. Okay? So every one of you has a responsibility to get ready to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Every one of you has that responsibility. Okay, what does the word earnestly mean? Contend, we've already mentioned men to fight for or fight against, fight for truth, fight against a false doctrine, contend. Earnestly do that. Earnestly do that. What does that mean? Okay, you've got to make a, a good effort. You've got to be strong. Uh, determined. Okay, you're absolutely determined. You're not going to allow the false doctrine to come in, you're going to stand up. You're not going to ignore a little bit. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. If you start, ever start ignoring a little bit, if you ever start to compromise a little bit, that's going to be the, uh, what is it about the camel getting his head in the tent? There's something about that if, if you leave enough room for a, a camel to get his nose under the tent, he's going to he's going to uproot that whole tent. All you've got to do is leave a little crack, a little a little leaven, and it, and the thing's going to uh, it's going to explode. It'll destroy the church. False doctrines will false doctrines will destroy the church. What is the church? The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. What is the faith that was once delivered to the saints? It's the truth. So what have you got to fight for? The truth. You've got to earnestly contend with the faith of the ones who live the saints. I've been here 42 years. There have been at least a half a dozen times that there's been a strong push by individuals that were promoting false doctrine. And people follow them. Do you know which people follow them? What kind of people in the church would follow somebody that's teaching false doctrine? The ones who aren't earnestly contending for the truth. Okay, number one, they're people that are not earnestly contending for the faith. Of once, they're not earnestly contending for the truth. What else? All, all, all the time it was the same kinds of people that follow them. It's people that I had already offended because of sin in their life. They were already mad at me, and so they were glad to follow somebody else. Always. Okay? False teachers will come in, and people will follow false teachers. They have, that's right. Teachers having itching ears. Uh, our time is up. Listen, please. Uh, He's going to, in verses 5, 6, and 7, let me just quickly show you three or four things. Verse 5, 6, and 7. Verse 5, uh, what he begins to do is he gives three examples of divine vengeance that God poured out. In verse 5, he says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once do this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Is that a frightening thing? Who did he save out of Egypt? Who did he save out of Egypt? Children. Children of Israel. Who did he later destroy? Children of Israel. Why? 
Yeah. That's exactly right. So he says, I'm reminding you that God afterward destroyed those that uh, believe not. Verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Third thing, even as Solomon and Gomorrah. So what are the three particular uh, incidents of judgment that he mentions? First, in verse 5, the children of Israel after they were delivered out of Egyptian bodies. Verse 6, the angels that did not keep their first estate. Verse 7, Sodom and Gomorrah. Are those three very clear, horrible judgments that God brought on people? Okay? You go home and study. Study the book of Jude. Come back next week with various things that you clearly see in the book of Jude. Please. Study the book of Jude. Know what's in the book of Jude. Thank you for being here.